schools to resume come Monday 19th. Opposition leader slams Pogara deal. And Bomana CS opens sports turn. This is National MTV News with Dennis Orere. Welcome, this is Saturday's News. Pandemic controller David Manning on Monday this week announced that all schools in the country will resume classes on Monday, 19th of April 2021, under strict COVID-19 protocols. Whilst mask wearing and hand sanitizing on hand washing can easily be followed, social distancing will be a challenge, especially in the classroom where the 1.5 meter social distancing is not applicable. MTV visited two schools here in the nation's capital to find out just how they would cope with this measure. The following COVID-19 protocols are to be followed by teachers and students when school resumes on Monday. All staff and students must wear face masks, and sanitizers or end washing facilities must be provided at the school gates, in classrooms and staff rooms, and schools are encouraged to maintain social distancing at all times. The two measures, wearing of masks and end sanitizing or end washing can easily be applied in schools. Social distancing though, will be a challenge. When we come on Monday, I will meet with my uh, uh, senior teachers to work out a strategy where we will uh, receive uh, grade 9s and 11s and other days and grade 10s and 12s like last year. So the grade, uh, when, they, when the grade 10s and 12s come on, uh, on Mondays, they use all grade 9 and 10 classrooms. And grade 12, they use all grade 11 and 12 classrooms. So that's a strategy we are looking at to avoid uh, overcrowding. Badi Agua Secondary School is choosing to do shift teaching. Jubilee Secondary School on the other end will choose otherwise. Principal Mrs. Miles told MTV News that the school is ready to receive all students on Monday. And while social distancing will be a challenge for the school, they will do their best to adhere to this measure. Teachers of both secondary schools are looking forward to receiving all students on Monday. Yana Zoriri, National MTV News. Meanwhile, Badi Hago Secondary Principal Maru Bala has called on the government to release COVID-19 funds to schools to assist them in their preparedness to COVID-19. Mr. Bala said schools had to use their TFF funding to install wash facilities on school grounds and source hand sanitizers. My money, we don't have any even COVID-19 funding. And so we are blowing up the uh, very little uh, uh, the money that we have received, TFF and the, the parents' uh, component. But I'm uh, talking about millions of Kina has been poured into the uh, in the country, but we are frontliners, schools are frontliners, but we are not receiving any, um, uh, say, um, COVID-19 funding. Opposition leader Belden Nama says there is nothing to celebrate on the Pogara deal, which Prime Minister James Marape is celebrating, as that was the offer on the table right from the start. In a media statement released this week, Nama says the mine closure has cost the country much and the reopening will cost it much more. It's been two weeks since Prime Minister James Marape finally announced the much-anticipated reopening of the Pogara gold mine in Enga province. And not only to reopen the mine, but to announce the deal involving landowners and other stakeholders. Prime Minister Marape said government is poised to sign an agreement with Barrick Gold for reopening of the Pogara gold mine 12 months after its closure last April over rejection of renewing the mining lease by the state. In announcing the breakthrough in negotiations by the state and Barrick, PM Marape said Papua New Guinea would receive a far superior deal than the 31 years from 1989 to 2021 adding that landowners and anger provincial government will get more and the balance of equity through Kumul Minerals will mean PNG will hold majority in equity. The Prime Minister also said other benefits include securing and increased an upfront tax with no concession, as is the case with other resource projects, 
An increase in royalties as well as a better handle on environment and resettlement issues at Pogara and a barrack exit option. Responding to the deal and the announcement of the reopening of the mine, opposition leader Belden Nama says there is no reason to celebrate about the deal. Mr. Nama says had PM Marape read his letter from his Canadian counterpart and listened to the CEO of Barrick and Zijin Mining before he arrogantly rushed to close the mine, he would have seen the offer and there would have been no need to close the mine. The opposition leader says before Prime Minister Marape congratulates himself on future revenue from the Pogra gold mine, he must tell the nation how much his short-term pain through the closure of the mine has cost the nation. He raised the question of whether the Prime Minister can guarantee the return of jobs for the 3,600 workers of Pogara and a back pay for the losses suffered for no fault of theirs. Whilst many in the business community have welcomed the announcement for investor confidence sake and to benefit landowners greater than before with an increase of 46% from the previous deal, others including the opposition leader have still criticised the deal based on possible consequences. Mr Nama says under the agreement just agreed to, Barrick will finance the restart of the mine which it can do and it can finance 64% of shareholders' equity, including 10% free carry equity for landowners. Barrick New Guinea Limited, jointly owned by Barrick Gold of Canada and China's Zijing Mining, has both the capital and the credit rating to borrow for its share of the deal if it has to. But Nama raised the question on where Mineral Resources Anger will get its money to finance its 5% share and where Kumul Mineral Holdings will get its funds for its 36% given potential impacts to PNG's debt-to-GDP ratio. You're watching National MTV News. More stories after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. A Chinese national business owner in Lei, Mei Lin, has denied deals made between her company, KC2 Limited, and NHC to hand over a state property to offset their debt with KC2. Mei Lin's response follows a statement by Oro Governor Gary Jufa concerning an investigation into this deal resulting in an eviction by the NHC two weeks ago in Lei. A media interview arranged by KC2 owner on these allegations was disrupted by Mei Lin's private security personnel. Julie Badui Owa reports. The owner of KC2 Limited, Mei Lin, called on the National Housing Corporation to clear the company's name as soon as possible after denying allegations of the company's involvement in a deal to transfer a state property to the company to offset debt owed by NHC to KC2. They got liability with us. In the property we bought, we don't move in since 2013. But we given a demand later to NHC, us NHC, either refund the money or give me another property for the replacement. Otherwise, we take them to the court. Lin's response follows a statement by Oro Governor and Chair of the Special Parliamentary and Committee surrounding the NHC KC2 deal following recent media reports on an eviction at Lay's Common Street. The short term strategy is to look at symptoms such as this symptoms which arise which uh, give us grave concern that an organization is not functioning as it ought to. You know, and uh, so in this instance, we, we are looking at the recent media report and other reports that have come in about uh, these activities taking place in, in, in particularly in Lei, where state-owned properties under the custody of the National Housing Commission or corporation has been sold uh, by various persons or purportedly sold. So we are going to conduct a preliminary investigation into this to get the facts in regard to what is happening. Almost three weeks ago, the National Housing Corporation in Lei evicted two families from this property. 
According to NHC Acting Provincial Manager Matthew Limu, the eviction was carried out due to outstanding areas and rentals. Our headquarters in Port Mosby, uh, they owe us about 11 million to NHC. Those are outstanding areas. When we asked him about what would be done to the vacant property, with the presence of a security company guiding the property, he said a decision would be made by the management to hand over the property to a company due to their liability cost. Limu refused to mention the name of the company and asked the NHC regional manager, Andrew Agui, to respond. Basically, the previous management has sold some properties to KC2. And uh, you would be aware of all those properties, yeah. The number of properties were sold to uh, KC2. And to date, uh, KC2 has not taken any vacant position. I'm looking for a home for our Papua, local Papua New Guinean staff. Only in the NAC. We get an inquiry from the counter of NAC head office in Mosby. I ask, you have like an available house to Sunny Lole? I'm told, yes. Then they're giving us the offer. KC2 Limited is owned by a Chinese national, Mei Lin. She said the company employs over 400 employees and has been providing support to the government agencies in Lei who are in need of assistance and the communities. Meanwhile, there are allegations concerning KC2's involvement in evictions in Lei with few matters before the court. When we asked her how much NHC owes her and the number of properties she bought from NHC, the interview was disrupted by Maylin's bodyguards. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lei. The PNG Civil and Identity Registry, or PNG CIR, partnership with the Anglican and Lutheran churches will allow for pastors to be endorsed and trained by the PNG CIR to be marriage celebrants. While churches have celebrants who conduct these ceremonies, Acting Deputy Registrar General Salome Bogosia said this will allow them to record and recognize marriages both for the churches and the government. The Acting Deputy Registrar Salome Bogosia said while the government through the PNG CIR conducts marriages, partnering with the churches will mean more marriages get recognized both by the churches and the government. Under this partnership, nominated pastors will be endorsed by the Registrar General to be marriage celebrants and trained by the PNG CIR. For, for us to expand and, and decentralize this function, allow churches to, to conduct marriages and bring it to us so that we, we have it recorded in our system is, is one of the things that are covered in this partnership. And we want churches and all the marriages that happen in the country, we want to know these marriages, we want to have it registered. This arrangement is part of the memorandum of partnerships signed between the PNG CIR and the Lutheran and Anglican churches yesterday to roll out the NID project. The Lutheran Church's General Secretary, Bennett Kaisum, says while the church keeps records of church marriages, this will allow government recognition as well. Uh, with the marriages, yes, uh, it's good now that our people will know that the government will now know them. It will make it more clearer so they will participate in these uh, marriage ceremonies within the uh, civil registry of the uh, government. Apart from helping register marriages, the church's role as PNG CIR partners will be to mobilize the communities, conduct awarenesses and collect details of congregation members. The NID team provides logistical support for staff, ensures data is collected and the completed NID documents are delivered and issued within a minimal time frame. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lei. The newly established District Procurement Committee of Yanguru Sausia District has been sworn into office recently. This will now see procurement exercise being conducted at district level. 
Local MP Richard Maru says the procurement committee will play a vital role in effective service delivery. The district procurement committee is made up of five members, and that includes the district administrator Jacob Yafai as the chairman, the district finance manager, Yangru police station commander, a women's rep, and a community rep. The district procurement committee was officially sworn in by Magistrate Gary Unjo. The bulk majority of our people live in the rural settings, and when the new board came into office, it, we, we, we took an undertaking to make sure that we roll out all the district and provincial procurement committees. Because these committees are very important to procure goods and services at the district and the provincial levels. That's where most of our people are. The district procurement committee was established under the National Procurement Act and they are recognized by the National Procurement Commission Board to conduct procurement at district level. Under the previous Central Supply and Tenders Board, districts do not have the capacity to do their own procurement and that has been a contributing factor to the lack of basic services at district level. With the procurement committee in place, they will be responsible to procure contracts up to 2.5 million kina. No, first is the trust of limits. Anything about 500,000 kina and less than 2.5 million kina is uh, will be procured by the district. So before you make uh, a decision, you look at what the personal limit is. If it is less than 2.5 million kina, then you can sit there and preside of our, or decide on that, on that contract. The procurement committee was also given instructions on what to do and what not to do, and that is for all contracts to be awarded to local contractors only and all tender notices to be advertised to avoid closed-door deals. This is a privilege given to them by the NPC board, and it can be revoked if processes are not followed, and there are penalties for their actions. And but for the procurement uh, function, NPC is the head of the procurement function. means for the board, uh, the chairman is... <coughs> Yes, the one, and, and the board members are dedicated the board powers to use so If anything goes wrong with the procurement functions out there, the same board will also withdraw. Uh, so that's why you have to procure properly, following the, uh, the laws in the procurement act. Local MP Richard Maru was grateful with the support of the National Procurement Commission to see this committee established. He says the Procurement Committee will play a vital role in answering financial decisions are made quickly to help improve service delivery. The local MP challenged the committee not to be influenced by outside politics and to be open to public scrutiny. I can assure you as local member of parliament I want this committee to function outside of politics. This is a very important committee, it must do its job and its records and the way it performs its function must be open to public scrutiny. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. National Procurement Commission CEO Simon Bolle is urging all districts to have an office space established for their district procurement committee. The office space is for the committee to keep their files and to do their job effectively. He says under the previous Central Supply and Tenders Board structure, districts have no offices which resulted in contracts being procured late. He says failure to have this office established may result in their privilege to procure projects being revoked by the NPC Board. Uh, with that, please, you must also have an office in there. That's where you store your documents, all the uh, meeting documents, all the tender documents because you will send us reports. If you don't have office space, you cannot uh, take the procurement activities or documents in the car and meet in the car and sign in the car and you, you don't know where to file up. And then the board will be after you. You don't have records there, so when you ask for report, you don't have records. And then the board will remove your board powers. So <clears throat> the problem in previous years is that most of the projects are delayed. Eh? Most projects are delayed. You don't know where to go to the province or come to NPC. When you want to procure, the projects are delayed and the law is catching up with us. And we have, around this time, it's, it's a big period. Eh? Our political leaders, our members, they want to do procurement as soon as possible. Eh? Expedite projects. Eh? Those kind of process will come. So that's why you are there. So you will be procuring for that district.
Tokai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. The Bomana Correctional Service High Security Unit Division officially opened their sports tournament for the year yesterday. This is part of the CS Welfare and Rehabilitation Program for the detainees. The annually held sporting tournament gives opportunity to detainees to engage themselves in different sporting codes. This activity is also used as a therapy for detainees to have a positive mindset during the pandemic. It's an annual thing that we allow the detainees to come out to play, uh, participate in mostly non-contact sports as volleyball, uh, rugby touch and soccer, just to keep them occupied while waiting for, especially those remands who are waiting for to go to the courts. Uh, and during this time, pandemic times we have now, COVID-19, uh, to get rid of the stress and anxiety and all these things that is uh, coming into their minds. And Over the past few years, there has been no assistance from the CS Ministry and responsible members to sponsor the tournament. <laughs> Fortunately, Arau Investments Managing Director Peter Dominic has stepped in to support the tournament by donating 5,000 kina as well as presenting new balls to signify the start of the 2021 sports calendar. Their relatives used to come during the weekend and visit them and all this, but now they are confined and restricted for outside visitation and all this, so I have to come and then give them sponsor and occupy themselves so that their mind must be busy playing sports, taking part in, taking part in like playing sports and all this. The games will be played in three different divisions, high security unit, medium security unit and the female ring. Suli Suli, Trukai Sports. With the opening of the 2021 sports calendar for the Bomana Correctional Service, Acting Commanding Officer Superintendent Yeli Oyufa is calling out to responsible leaders as well as business houses to assist in supporting the sporting activities for detainees. You know, those prisoners here that, are, that we have in Bomana all comes from NCD, over the past years. Uh, there is lack of support from our MPs. Uh, Northeast, Northwest, and uh, must be South. Uh, it's, we've been doing it tough here uh, during the COVID-19 period. We're doing, we're doing it tough here, uh, limited resources. So I'm calling out to all our members to come in and assist. Uh, probably if they can contribute a ball or two to help support our sports for 21, it will be very good. The weather report for the next 24 hours after these messages. Stay with us. Tukai Sports. Tukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. Regional weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, Port Moresby and Popondeta, cloudy with brief showers. Kerama, partly cloudy with evening showers. Daru, cloudy with showers. Alotau, cloudy with a few showers. To the Momase region, Lei and Medang, cloudy with few showers. Wewek, cloudy periods with brief showers. Vanimo, cloudy with rain showers. To the New Guinea Islands region, Lorengau, cloudy with few showers. KVN, Kokopo, Rabaul and Kimbe, few showers. Buka, partly cloudy periods. And in the Highlands region, all centres to have cloudy with a few showers. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's the news, sports and weather for Saturday the 17th of April 2021. Pleasant viewing, be safe, bye for now. <laughs>